So welcome, Ellen. Thank you for joining me for a conversation on uncertainty and the unknown and mystery. <laughs> My favorite things. Mm. And for anyone listening, you're also welcome to refer to her as Magical Ellen. I, <laughs> I actually ha tried to call her the other day and couldn't find her. I couldn't find you in my phone because I was looking under Ellen rather than Magical Ellen, and I had put you in as Magical <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. It is, yes. So Even my entry in your phone is unknown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, to start, I'm wondering if you could inspire us with a story of going into the unknown and having it actually go well. Mm, I feel like that's just my whole life, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um most recent story was yesterday actually we had a when I head into the unknown I like to have a plan of this is sort of which sounds a little bit counterintuitive of planning for the unknown but you have a direction like a, a vague idea of this is what I would like to experience and then sort of head out in that general direction and be open to whatever happening whatever magic you might encounter on the way and that's what happened yesterday. We had a plan to go to Bahana Gorge, which is this beautiful walk, and then you get rewarded at the end of this three and a half K walk that's very hilly with this gorgeous waterfall and lots of um, swimming holes. And that was the plan. We got about halfway down that very hilly walk and looked over the edge of the path, which was quite a steep drop. We were just like, that looks like a pretty amazing swimming hole right there. <laughs> So we were kind of scouting up and down the edge of the path and found a bit with some rocks looks like it might be possible that we got down there and so we scrambled down and a few false starts and having to re-navigate our way around these ginormous rocks and eventually we got down to the bottom where there was this glorious swimming hole with deep bits of shallow bits and a little mm -hmm. waterfall and a cave and we had the entire place to ourselves and mm -hmm. it wasn't anywhere near as far to walk which is good because it was a hot sweaty day mm -hmm. and it was just really affirming again as usual that have a plan this is what I'm going to go do and be open to other things happening along the way like yeah. magic swimming holes and yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's a beautiful metaphor too I've definitely been on bushwalks when I was like I felt comfortable and and like excited to go exploring off the path and other bushwalks where I was like um no thank you I'm going to stick to the path that does not look safe <laughs> yeah. it's important to stay safe when you are adventuring into the unknown um, yeah. safe but not rigid I think it's the yeah have, a, have an embodied sense of safety of like this is cool I can manage this I'm not gonna like we weren't seriously there was a point where we're like, we should have brought some rope. Then we could have really get down there. But <laughs> we're like, all right, next time maybe we'll bring some rope. Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah, there's something, there's like a discernment there, isn't there, about um, yeah. what what level of, of risk you're willing to take and also um, picking up cues of, of safety around you and, and what mm. might or might not be a good chance to take. Yeah, head prepared into the unknown. <laughs> um, have you have you always felt that comfortable with heading into the unknown? <laughs> no, no, I have not. Um, I'm giggling for two reasons. Kind of heading prepared into the unknown has its own challenges of you end up with, but I might need that, and I might need that, and I might yeah. need that. I need all of yeah. these things. And, yeah. yeah yeah that's me that. like going camping it's like I'm always the one who remembers to bring the important things like the Swiss army knife and you know mm. I always I also think that baby wipes are a necessity for camping that's my personal opinion yes but um, I often... cable ties and gaffer tape and 
<laughs> and then you like have why do I have so much stuff in the car? Like, yeah, I might these things. But then it's the like, unknown. <laughs> why does it take me, you know, so many hours to prepare to go away for a weekend? And how do I end up with all this shit that I have to pack and then put away when I get back? It's a mm. double-edged sword. Mine just all lives in the back of my car. <laughs> always ready to go. But it wasn't always like that. Um, to get back to your question from before, I'm thinking about, I actually don't know how many years ago it would have been now, maybe between 15 and 20 years ago. So a while. I remember that I used to live in a house and our washing machine had died an untimely death. And so I had to go around the corner to the laundromat to do my laundry. And if anybody asked me on a Saturday morning, like, do you want to go get a coffee? Would you like to come with us to do whatever? We're having a picnic in the park. Didn't matter what it was. I was like, oh, yeah, but no, I can't because I have to go do my laundry. <laughs> it was like rigid, fixed, Saturday morning, laundry time. It didn't really occur to me that I could possibly have gone to the laundromat or any other time during the week. It was so fixed that no, this is the time that this happens. And if I think about doing it at another time, I get really anxious and kind mm. of like, I, mm. it makes me feel very uncomfortable. So no, it has to happen at this time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a funny example, but the like anxiety that you describe is also a very real thing. And I, um, I don't remember any examples quite like that, but I definitely relate to like, if I make a plan and the plan changes. I have not always been so cool with that. <laughs> yes. The, the feeling of like, oh, 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 what's happening? It's not, I'm not, you know, the, mm. the, the certainty is, is soothing in a way because you can predict, you can prepare. It feels safer, even if it isn't necessarily like objectively safer, it feels that way. Mm. And then we get things like global pandemics and COVID and all of the plans and things, certainty that we thought we had just disappears. And it was like, oh, ooh, now what do we do? And we left with half the world feeling, well, maybe more than half the world feeling super uncomfortable because the things that they thought they could rely on have evaporated. Yeah. And well, we're in this global time of uncertainty and how do we navigate that in a way that feels good and that has it feeling more like heading into the mystery rather than heading into like panic uncertainty, which yeah. is challenging in this situation, like really challenging. Yeah. yeah. I think actually hearing you say that, I think that the last podcast episode we did together, which was about seasons and cycles, I think we did that right around the beginning of the pandemic. Mm, we did. So this is interesting kind of coming back to that situation again a number of months later mm. yeah six months down the line we're still in a state of uncertainty and transition time between seasons like I think we were talking about heading into autumn and yeah. we're maybe a little bit further in but I think we're still in that autumn phase of we haven't quite hit whatever winter is going to look like we're still trans kind of that word translating transitioning that's the word from what we had into whatever's next and it's scary and yeah. for people like me that used to have a plan and then a plan b and then a plan c so i always <laughs> had an option <laughs> to have all of that just take it away it's like yeah. oh, oh well we're gonna get really good at not knowing what's happening and yeah yeah so when you say autumn you mean kind of like um, the the energy of autumn happening in terms of what's what's happening to our kind of societies on a on a more global scale as we're being confronted with these big changes it's kind of forcing us to reevaluate and the old way of doing things is starting to fall away but it's not necessarily clear where mm. it's going yet is that am, am, yeah. is that right yeah yeah it's kind of a time of slowing down and as you were saying like reevaluating reassessing we can't just be all go all summer energy keep on going like the kind of full heat of summer anymore it's not available and we have to stop and take stock and mm. it's the harvest time autumn a lot of the time so we're looking at well look all right what have we got what are we left with we're heading into a different phase and 
what do we need to celebrate? What do we need to grieve? And mm. what do we, how do we prepare for what's coming? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And that is a real time of uncertainty, isn't it? We don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Or there's like a, even just saying that we don't know what's going to happen. There's, I just felt a little like, ooh, in my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me what to expect so I can plan for it. Yes. <laughs> so I, I do want to come back to like the mystery and looking at it that way. But before we do, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the uncertainty and the unknown and um, how the ways that that feels challenging to us. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about like the, a little bit more about the ways that we kind of find maybe a false sense of safety or security in trying to make things certain and defined. Hmm. Yeah. If we think we know what's happening next, then it's settling for our nervous systems. Like if I show you a door and tell you that behind the door, there's, I don't know, a chocolate cake and a plate and, you're welcome to go in and eat some you've got an idea of what to expect and you're going to open the door kind of being like oh this is good i get cake and <laughs> it's sort of it sets you up for how you might want to respond to what's behind the door um and it's sort of the same if we think we know what's happening next then it's easier to be like oh okay cool that's how we, we form habits and things with, with our days. We kind of know, oh, I get up in the morning and I do these things and then I don't have to think about it so much. It's also kind of um, not as mentally taxing because mm. we don't have to make so many decisions because yeah. we kind of know what's going to happen. If I give you the same door and be like, his door, behind this door is something. I'm not going to tell you what's behind the door. It might be good. It might be your worst nightmare. Here's the key. What are you <laughs> the noticing is happening in your body right now. <laughs> oh my god! I'm also noticing your face. I'm. I'm. As you say that, I'm picturing myself like opening the door, like really kind of on alert, like really mm. like tense, really focusing, paying attention, listening like all of my senses looking for any little bit of information they might pick up about what's behind the door. And I picture myself like maybe listening, turning the knob really slowly and it's like peeling it open a crack to see if something like jumps out at me or like if I can, what I can see and <laughs> just a whole, a whole bunch of like, um, like hyper alertness and mm. moving with a lot of, it feels like being like a wound up spring in my yeah. body as I imagine opening that door. But I'm looking at your face and you're like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a certain amount of glee over here throwing some of you <laughs> into the unknown. <laughs> also because I get to sort of picture what's behind the door. And I know there's probably something great behind this particular door, but you don't know that. And I'm having fun kind of just teasing you a little bit and planting <laughs> seeds of doubt. Are you going to tell me what's behind the door? I don't know. It's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> you can open it and find out. You can tell me what's behind the door. <sighs> also, mm. I have full trust that you'll be able to handle whatever it is that's behind that door. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk. Let's talk about that. About the the feeling you were sharing this before we started recording that um behind that need for predictability is a sense that like I don't know if I can handle this I don't trust myself that I could handle this if this if it doesn't go the way that I think it's gonna go or if I if yeah. it goes the way I don't want it to go yeah it's sort of that need for certainty is a it's like a coping mechanism to help our systems feel like they're regulated and able to deal with whatever it is that might be coming next and it's sort of I'm just noticing myself take a breath like oh yeah good <laughs> I can deal with whatever's happening next because it's predictable <laughs> and so we try and like 
trauma loves certainty. Mm-hmm. So if we know what's happening next, then we know that our system can kind of keep going as it has. There's not going to be any big surprises. There's not going to be anything that we really need to, to navigate. And so we try and create environments where we have that sense of certainty, um, whether it's through knowing without a shadow of a doubt that at 9am on Saturday morning, I'm going to be at the laundromat doing my laundry. <laughs> <laughs> or um, however we might want to sort of set that up. There's subtler ways that we do it as well. Um, it sort of is a way of managing things feeling too much or it's a way of mm-hmm. managing potential overwhelm or it's a way of kind of keeping ourselves in a state that feels manageable. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Yeah, in that sense, and when I hear you describe that, it's like a, a way of keeping things in a way that feels manageable. I'll, I get this kind of rush of tenderness for that that mm-hmm. desire for certainty because it's just a way of trying to take care of yourself and man to keep things manageable. Mm. That's really human. <laughs> and and it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's like all of our management strategies and coping mechanisms and defenses and all of that. Like they're all things that we've developed that to try and keep ourselves safe and try mm-hmm. and keep things feeling okay and manageable. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they're really effective because they work. And because here we are having this conversation and here people are listening to this conversation. So things of whatever we've developed to help us cope with uncertainty has worked. It's effective. It just may not be the way that we'd like to Mm. navigate it. It might Mm. be a way to manage uncertainty, feeling like, oh, shit, anything could happen. And like you were saying before, and I'm not sure that I can trust myself to deal with whatever is going to happen next. So I have to find a way to cope with that feeling of like it's not so much the uncertainty that is scary it's my uncertainty that I'm going to be able to manage the uncertainty yeah yeah that sort of can I trust myself do I have the capacity to deal with whatever might be coming next like is that there that level of resilience in my nervous system to be able to hold whatever might be behind that door yeah oh and I just cake behind that door can totally handle the cake but yeah (laughs) I just felt like a big sighing exhale as you were saying that. Like, mm. <sighs> okay. Okay. Um, could, and we, we used a couple of words there. Um, could we take a moment just to define what we mean by trauma and what we mean by regulated? You talked about your system, your nervous system being regulated. Hmm. Yeah. The simplest way that I like to define trauma is really what happens in our nervous systems when things happen to us or things happen around us. We have experiences that are too much or come at us too fast or sometimes not enough, not enough support or too often in the form of like shitty messages that we might get about who we are or how we respond to things. Mm -hmm. Um, where we're not able to stay in a regulated state. And what I mean by regulated is we have, I tend to have a a range of resilience where we have the capacity for something to happen and we can maybe be a little bit activated. Like I'll use the example since we're doing this door thing of we've peeked behind the door and the door slammed and we jump. Mm -hmm. And I would 100% jump. (laughs) <laughs> me too that's a, like an activated state where we're like oh what was that and mm-hmm. we look and we're like oh it's just the door okay cool and we settle mm-hmm. and so it's happened within our range of capacity we have mm-hmm. the capacity to be that activated go oh okay no that's cool and we can come back to more of a connected and grounded place settled and sometimes things happen where the door might slam or someone might be having a screaming argument behind the door and we get activated and we can't settle. We get stuck Mm. on, on up the Mm. top and we're sort of floating around outside of our capacity to settle and come back down. And then it's harder. It might take time. Some people spend their whole lives hanging out outside of their Mm -hmm. range of what their nervous system can actually handle, which Mm -hmm. sometimes looks like people who are 
all go all the time, like mm-hmm. super busy. I've got to have 700 and this was me for a while. Like I'm managing, like working and studying and doing all the things and going to the gym and having a social life and all of this feels like, where do I have time to rest? And I, yeah. how many coffees a day? Um, some. <laughs> <laughs> my instant reaction was like four maybe six <laughs> um it was a few just to sort of manage because I would didn't want to or didn't know how to come back down into yeah. a state that was a little yeah. bit more grounded and capable of connection and um so yeah the ability to regulate is the ability to be activated in some way mm-hmm. whether that's jumping into like a startle, whether it's a door slamming, whether it's getting a little bit depressed, feeling a little bit down, feeling a bit dissociated, but being able to come back Mm -hmm. into a state of connection Mm -hmm. and to be able to kind of ride those waves because they'll Mm -hmm. go up and down throughout the day. And it's not necessarily um, negative things that have you activated. Like I could open the door and be like, oh my God, cake and be so excited. (laughs) And that's an activated state. And I can be Uh like, cool, okay. Awesome. Have the cake. Receive the cake. Sit down. Smell the cake. Be like, oh. And then I can come down into a regulated, more regulated state and eat the cake. Yeah. And then go into a food coma, which is maybe a little <laughs> bit, and then come back up and be regulated. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, what you were describing with, with being like, um, I'll go all the time or having that, that level of like stuck on, on, is more like the the fight or flight mode yeah 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 can you talk a little bit about the freeze mode because that's that's a kind of extra layer of activation over Mm. fight or flight but it looks like less yeah right it's interesting it's sort of instead of jumping out the top of the window and we're hanging out on the roof for I'm really mixing my metaphors today, but we have like a window of tolerance. So this is where we can jump up and down. We can kind of be activated, settle, activated, settle. If we fly out the top of our window, we're sitting on the roof of our house and that's where the fight flight kind of things are. Or sometimes that energy, that big sympathetic charge, that sort Mm. of activated energy becomes way too much. And our system is like, let's just shut the whole thing down. Mm. And so we'd fall out the bottom of the window or we might fall off the roof, which sounds painful. (laughs) Um, And we hang out in the garden bed under the window where it's, we feel a bit freezy. We feel numb. We feel checked out. We feel a bit dissociated. We're not really present. And if we're stuck in that state for a long time, it can look like depression. It can Mm -hmm. look like what I had for a long time, which is a mood disorder where I didn't really feel anything. I just felt numb. Mm. But because that's all I felt, I thought it was normal. Mm. Um, and a lot of people do go undiagnosed with that kind of mood disorder because they're like, oh, well, this is just the way that I feel or don't feel. There's no, there is no up or down. It's this Mm. kind of numb gray state Mm -hmm. and to be stuck on off is kind of those sorts of qualities tend to show up. Yeah. Mm. 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 I think that that information is super useful for people to understand about how our nervous systems work. And when we, of course, this is like a lot of what you, you do in your work, but being able to um, track where we're at around that window and when we're getting stuck on on or stuck on off in, in fight or flight or in freeze or in um, when we get activated and can't, bring ourselves back into that window having that understanding is is so helpful and having that awareness is really i think the first step to being able to manage it and and it also then is is i'm thinking about um if we notice ourselves trying to make something certain or because we're so uncomfortable with the uncertainty mm. or just being like really, really uncomfortable with the idea of the unknown. Um, we can use that, that awareness to kind of manage our level of discomfort, or like use the, the window. Um, Cause that's, that's kind of what's happening, right? When we're, we're getting freaked out about uncertainty and the unknown 
is we're not necessarily sitting in that window of, of tolerance or resilience. Mm, yeah, particularly when we start to get a little bit panicky or a little bit mm-hmm. like, oh, shit, I have to sort this out. Oh, like I can't go to bed until this is sorted. Yes. I need to finish this thing. I have to like this kind of panicky energy yes. which comes yes. with like and um yeah it is a sign that maybe we need to just tend to like the coping mechanism is working overtime trying to find a way of bringing that certainty in so that we can feel like things are going to be okay we can feel like we can manage whatever's coming next and if we can start to notice that pattern when we're kind of freaking out about the unknown and Mm -hmm. look at recognize it for what it is that oh look I'm doing that thing. Hmm. What might I need instead? What might, how could I tend to this desire for certainty in a Mm -hmm. different way of trying to force a false sense of security in there? Like, what could I do instead? What might feel nice? How might I want to navigate this not knowing instead of trying Mm -hmm. to say no to all invitations that are called 9 on Saturday morning because I have to go do my laundry. How might I be able to say yes to these invitations, still have clean clothes and not panic? That the time's- <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about like, what might that look like to tend to that? How, so how can we kind of build our capacity to be with uncertainty and the unknown, um, even if it is at times uncomfortable, build our capacity so that we're making our decisions in alignment with what we really want, not making decisions reflexively just to get rid of that uncomfortable feeling. Mm. The first thing that really comes to mind is just slow everything down because Mm. when we have that panicky, oh shit I have to sort this out feeling like we want to fix it fast Mm -hmm. and the key words in there being fix it there's something wrong here we need to get rid of this feeling I want it out of this feeling I've got to change fix whatever yeah is to just take a breath take a moment and notice oh that's happening can I stop before I jump into that and just create a little bit of space around Mm -hmm. it a little bit of time around Mm -hmm. it and I slow things down just a little bit because there's no room for considered responding to things if we're frantically trying to fix or change or get out of how we're feeling Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah slow it down slow it down even just as you said that I was like oh slow it down that feels good yeah, mm. it feels good, and for some people, it feels really scary. It yeah, down. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it's sort of it's a process. It's a learning process of beginning to build a sense of self trust that whatever's behind the door, I'd be able to manage what's behind the door. Like it could be, I don't know, it could be the bogeyman, but that's fine. I've got the poker from the fire or whatever. I've got like <laughs> a, <laughs> I can deal with the bogeyman. It could be cake, totally got cake down. It could be, you know, a pathway into this magical, 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 mystical forest. Yeah. And I've got the resources to explore this path. It's kind of this feeling of, oh, well, whatever happens, whatever's behind the door, I can deal with it. Mm-hmm. And that's when the, the old shit, anything could happen, starts to turn into a, ooh, anything could happen. Mm-hmm. Instead mm-hmm. of being like, oh, fuck, what's, what's coming at me and am I going to have the capacity to deal with it? It's like yeah. um, anything could be coming and I've got the resources. Yeah. And a big part yeah. of that is having support, like realizing yeah. we have to navigate the unknown all by ourselves. Yes. 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 Let's talk about that more because I think that is so important, especially because, um, and I know that I have a tendency to do this for myself too, but when we f- think a lot about, 
healing and growth and and how how we want to feel how we want to be a lot of the focus is on ourselves as individuals and we kind of forget that we are part of webs of communities and and networks and that that's actually how we were designed we were designed mm -hmm. to be um in in connection and in support with each other and that's that's one of the relationships that you and i have um is that that mutual support and it is like it's making the biggest difference in my life and i've been able to step into a period of my life with greater uncertainty greater risk um than before and that that support from you and knowing that we have that it's not just that there's support but that i can really rely on it it's reliable and yeah. i can trust we can trust each other that makes makes it feel so much more manageable hmm. i think that's a really really important point that it's particularly when we're trying scary things or yes. we're stepping yes. into more kind of unknown unknowns than perhaps we thought we could or that perhaps we had before is if we get to a place that feels really scary or really activating or we're like well outside of our windows it's really hard to get back in by ourselves yeah yeah so having the support of somebody else that's yeah. like oh well you've gone through the door and there's like a boogeyman behind your door and like you're freaking out and that's totally cool. And I'm sort of not through the same door. I'm over here being like, Oh, well, I can still see that you're okay. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to look back at somebody and be like, Oh, well, you're okay. And you're looking at me like I'm okay. So maybe I am okay. Maybe I can handle this. Maybe yeah. I do have the capacity and yeah. together we can navigate this. It just makes it so much easier to, navigate the unknown yeah thinking about my adventure yesterday to the waterfall if i hadn't been going with a friend there's probably no way that i would have scrambled down that rock yeah thing, thing on my own yeah because there were two of us and we were egging each other on and being like oh well you believe that i could do it we both think that we could get down there like it's one of us would be a little bit ahead being like yeah yeah come around this way go down that way <laughs> put your foot there it's like oh okay cool and we made it together to the bottom yeah. And it's also, I mean, that's also just like a, a wiser way of approaching the risk, because if you were out bushwalking by yourself, um, it, it, it's a higher risk if you're on your own and something happens. But if you're with mm -hmm. someone else, then someone else can, can take care of you or go for help. Um, it's, it's not really like throwing yourself into um, some completely unmanageable level of risk there's there's like some kind of net there yeah yeah mm. it's highly unlikely that we're both gonna get eaten by <laughs> oh <laughs> have you ever seen a snake in the aussie bush yes i have many mm. usually they're over there yeah but there was one time where i was walking by myself and there was this big rustling in the bush and a snake fell out of the bush onto the path directly in front of me and did this whole like squirmy thing and I jumped about a mile in the <laughs> and then it kind of righted itself and disappeared back into yeah. the bush was, yeah that was a very scary experience yeah um, mm. what was it doing I have no idea what it was doing. It was just sort of mm. having a fit or. <laughs> <laughs> but they do. I mean, m most of the time they, they don't want to attack you, do they? They, no. they just, they want to just like piss off and get as far away from you as possible. As long as you give them the space to do that. Mm. Yes. Mm. Um, but coming back to, to support, can we also tease out a little bit? Like what's the difference between a really nourishing, supportive relationship with someone, whether that's a friend or a practitioner or your partner versus what's more of a codependent dynamic. And I kind mm -hmm. of have, I have like a couple of ideas on that, but I'm curious to hear what you think too. 
yeah. The first things that really come to mind are these two questions, which I really love, which are what do I need and how am I going to get it? Um, and so I think the difference between a really supportive relationship of navigating the unknown together is this kind of empowered piece of I can navigate this and I know what to ask for or when to ask or and I understand that the people I ask are allowed to have boundaries and they're allowed to say no or not today or maybe tomorrow or I could do it this way but not that way um, and it becomes a like a dance together of navigating mm -hmm. the unknown and navigating the, the supportive relationship inside of the unknown um, rather than will you fix it for me or like, yeah. oh, this, is, this is broken. I don't know. I give up. Yeah. What do I do? Yeah. Uh, saying that I'm like, there have been times where I have asked people, just tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> there was a the time <laughs> but <laughs> I've been noticing myself recently with a, the resurgence of a pattern. And I noticed the urge in me to just collapse and want someone else to jump in and save me. It's one of those mm. things that, um, you know, I, I think of like growth and healing as a spiral. And so you come mm. back around to the same patterns or experiences or feelings, but it's a little bit different each time. And mm. this time I'm like, I'm able to notice it and feel it without like being um, overtaken by it as much mm -hmm. as I have previously. But the feeling is there. Like sometimes, don't you just want someone to fix it for you? My God. <laughs> yes, I do. I love it when I'm feeling overwhelmed and someone just tells me what to do, but it has to be the right person telling me in the right way things mm -hmm. that I already wanted to do because yeah, yeah. <laughs> telling me what to do and it's like, don't tell me what to do. But yeah. part of me is like, please do tell me what to do. <laughs> if you tell me like that and tell me this, then I won't do it. But if you tell me what to do and it's that and then, okay, I'm going to be like so grateful. <laughs> really interesting how there's like such defined parameters on the way that I will accept support when I'm in that codependent, like I want you to fix it, but not like that. <laughs> Whereas if there's like a little bit more, it's again, the slowing down and creating a little mm. bit of space and they're mm. like, wow, I'm really overwhelmed by what's behind this door. I need a little bit of support. Can I talk this through with you? Or maybe it's enough just to say this is hard and have someone recognize that or mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Creating a little bit of spaciousness to walk together through whatever it is rather than yeah. having to navigate the unknown all by yourself. Yeah. I think um, to add to that, from the perspective of the person offering support, um, if it's more on the codependent side of things, it's more like, if I'm helping you, I need to fix you. I need to make it better. I can't handle you being uncomfortable. And so I need to make that uncomfortable feeling go away so that I can be comfortable. Yeah, so it's like, oh, I can't navigate your uncertainty and your unknown because it's making me uncomfortable. So I'm trying to make your uncertainty certain. <laughs> <laughs> creates this kind of circle of like, oh, you're not comfortable with your unknown and I'm not comfortable with my not knowing how to fix your not knowing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so the, 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 I think the healthier side of it is that if I'm supporting someone, I can... I can feel with them like, oh, that's so uncomfortable. I can be with them in that without trying to jump in with unwanted advice, mm. without trying to fix it or make it better in a way that might not be best for them. It's like I can mm. listen to what kind of support they need and, I'm ask and are asking for and offer that and that I might feel with you, but it's not that I'm not, um, but I know that the feeling that, that it, it's yours, not mine. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a super important point because it's that, that urge to, I've got to fix it for you. I've got yeah. to make that uncomfortable thing go away. It's more yeah. about me. It's not really about you. Mm. Me making your uncomfortable feeling go away is going to make me feel better. It's not really going to empower you to navigate your unknown in any way at all. Yes. 
So it's that, yeah, just being able to be really, I guess, comfortable with the discomfort of sitting with someone who's in that uncomfortable place. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't really know where I'm, what I am or where I'm going or what's happening or I'm navigating something that feels challenging and just to be able to sit with somebody in that and be like, yeah, I see that that's really super challenging and mm-hmm. I'm just going to sit here with you and I can keep you company in the challenge and I can believe in your ability to navigate it. Yeah. Um, but I don't have to fix it or do anything necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And to kind of like take another step along this thread. How about when someone, this is, this is a question from a listener. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, and if anyone else listening has questions to submit for the podcast, you can um, email me, contact me through my website and message me through Instagram. Um, but the question from the listener is about how to, to how do I navigate uncertainty within myself and noticing a pattern of like looking to other people for reassurance, but wanting strategies to be able to handle the uncertainty myself. And I imagine maybe a sense of like knowing what to do or, or not to do. Mm. Yeah. I have a few thoughts. Um, I think it's kind of awesome. It's like, how do I navigate uncertainty in myself? I'm going to ask other people outside of me how to navigate it in me (laughs) (laughs) and seeking external information, but that's good. Um, And I think it starts with just starting really small because it's what you want to build that trust that whatever happens, I've got this, whatever uncertainty sort of shows up in my life, I'm going to be able to navigate it. And that starts by really tuning in to the little needs that we have throughout Mm -hmm. the day where it's like Mm -hmm. I have a little feeling of like discomfort or a little feeling of contraction or a little feeling of anxiety or fear or it might even be something like I'm hungry or I'm thirsty or I'm tired like listening to those little cues from our bodies that we need something if it's like oh I'm feeling really anxious what might I need maybe I just need to reach out and tell a friend that I'm feeling anxious and can you just tell me that I'm okay or Mm -hmm. if I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed maybe I just need to take a moment to wrap myself in a blanket and just Mm. feel a little bit contained Mm -hmm. or if I'm feeling a little bit kind of cranky it's like well actually I haven't really eaten for a while maybe I need to have a snack Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it sounds really simple but learning to pick up those tiny little cues of like this something doesn't feel right which the unknown being a scary thing is like a big cue of something doesn't feel right Mm -hmm. so if we start with the really small ones and learn to track those and meet those needs consistently it starts to build that sense of internal self-trust that Mm -hmm. whatever happens I'm going to be able to interpret and meet that need whatever happens behind the door it might be a bigger feeling of anxiety but I've handled little feelings of anxiety so I know how to do that I know how to reach out for support or I know Mm. what things I've tried in the past that have helped that feeling settle and feel yeah yeah and so like self-soothing the the intensity of that feeling yeah self-soothing or you know knowing enough to reach out for someone to help us soothe Mm -hmm. to help us co-regulate that to tend that feeling Mm -hmm. and if we do that enough times we build a sense of trust Mm -hmm. that no matter what happens I'm going to be able to understand what I need and I'm going to be able to meet that need and once we have that self-trust then we feel more confident being able to manage whatever comes our way and Mm. it's easier for us to take risks because we know that whatever happens as a result of whatever action we try and take I can deal with it and that's when we really start to come into our own sense of personal power and when the unknown that is scary starts to turn into the unknown that is a mystery and it's like anything could happen yes Mm. and I, along the same lines, I would add that you can reflect on 
all of the times in your life when you did handle it, mm. when something went um, something went wrong or something was unexpected, whether it was a good unexpected or, or bad unexpected, the big things or the little things when you, you did handle it, you did find your way, you did mm. make solid choices, you did ask for the kind of help that you needed to handle it. Mm. And so, yeah, that's also kind of taking in the evidence from all of the ways that you already have that capacity. Because mm. like you know, you, so much evidence because yeah. here you are. Everything that you've done in your life has worked because you're here, you've survived. You're <laughs> Everything <laughs> you've done has kept you alive. <laughs> yes. I remember that's making me think of, um, I was in a car accident a few years ago with one of my brothers and we were standing on the nature strip afterwards just feeling a bit shocked and a bit sort of like and my brother turned to me and he's like well we still have a hundred percent success rate at staying alive <laughs> <laughs> and that was so exactly what i needed to hear at that moment and it Aww. stayed with me that like wow yeah, yeah you're actually you're right Every, i have a hundred percent success rate at staying alive. <laughs> No matter what's happened and how it's happened and how I handled it or didn't handle it, it I still have a hundred percent success rate in staying yeah. alive. Yeah. 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 <sighs> yeah. Even though the unknown does feel scary and challenging, we have a hundred percent success rate at navigating that in some ways, depending on how you look at it, but from a certain light. Mm. Mm we may want to get a little bit more skillful at it and that's cool it's something that we can work towards but yeah yeah we already have the capacity to to deal with yeah the unknown yeah and building that trust is a is a matter of um building that that muscle or the trust builds over time it's like an accumulation of all of the little events and all of the little occurrences and the big ones that mm. um, show us that something is reliable. Yeah. So it's not something that you just like flip a switch necessarily, but it's something that you can gather and focus on and um, mm. keep building towards. Yeah. Definitely. I didn't go from somebody that refused all invitations of anything because I had to do my laundry to, I think, like this whole year has been an experiment in the unknown for me. Yeah. Five months ago, I packed up everything that I had, put it all in storage and moved 2,000 kilometres away north um, into the unknown just because it felt like a good idea at the time. <laughs> There's no way that I would have been out of the, the version of me that couldn't let go of doing her laundry at 9am on Saturday morning or would not have been able to do that. <laughs> so it's been a process yeah. over years of being yeah. able to just test it, test it, test it, build that trust up till it got to a point where I'm like, oh, I'm really feeling the call to just follow this intuition into the unknown mm -hmm. and being able to say yes to it and mm -hmm. manage it with some degree of grace whereas I yeah. think if I'd tried to do that 20 years ago it would have been with a whole lot of terror if at all <laughs> oh oh that makes me yeah. feel tender for you 20 years mm -hmm. ago Ellen yes I have so, just a picture of me at sitting at the laundromat at the moment just being like it's a <laughs> yeah past me yeah oh, past Ellen if only I could go back and tell you things are going to be good. Oh. How are they going to work out? Yeah. Mm. What would you say to past Ellen? That's a good question. I don't know that I would really... I'm trying to think of what I could say to her that wouldn't have her feel like, oh, shit, I'm going to do what? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> how much growing and how much change and how painful is it going to be to evolve to the point where I can do that? Oh. <laughs> so really, I'd probably just tell her everything's going to be fine. Everything. Then let good. her believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. So now I would love you to tell us about uncertainty versus mystery mm. 
Yes, uncertainty versus mystery. And I think we've already touched on this a little bit, like what lies underneath both of those things. Uncertainty to me has a little bit more of a scary quality or like I'm noticing yeah. if I think about the word uncertainty, there's a stillness in my body and there's a little bit of like, I just need to hang back here and check this out first there's like an uncertain quality to how I'm kind of interface with the word even just like, mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Maybe like, what do I need to put in place to make this feel okay? Like mm -hmm. I'm that kind of, that sort of, I need a pause. I'm like mm -hmm. leaning away a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then if I think about mystery, there's like a kind of, it feels enticing. There's a more of a leaning towards and my body feels a little bit softer and I'm more of like, ooh, what's in there? This looks fun. Anything could um, happen. Anything could happen. And it's going to be magical when it does. Um, and it's really interesting because they're kind of the same thing, but it's like how, how I meet uncertainty is like, oh, do I have the capacity to deal with this? I'm anticipating something that's going to be hard or yeah. scary or too much or overwhelming. Whereas if I'm looking at mystery, I'm anticipating something that's going to be interesting or mm -hmm. different or new mm -hmm. or exciting or like I'm very curious about mystery, whereas I'm wary of uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> and I think underneath that is like, my perception of my capacity to manage whatever happens, whether it's yeah. uncertain or whether it's mysterious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Mm, it's a mystery. Mystery is definitely like when I think of you and I think of that word, I think of the way that you talk about the, the deep dark woods and going in with your lantern and like maybe finding Baba Yaga's house. Mm. yes <laughs> that's on my bucket list actually <laughs> going into the deep dark woods to find Baba Yaga's house which gets around on chicken legs which is the coolest thing ever I'm like I want a walking house that walks around on bird legs that would just be like my life would be complete <laughs> if I lived there <laughs> but I like to I like the metaphor of the deep dark woods because it kind of contains everything. It's sort of, there's so much possibility and magic and it is the unknown kind of, that's personified for me, the deep dark woods. You can find all sorts of things in there like monsters and bears and witches, wicked witches and otherwise and mm -hmm. wise women. And mm -hmm. it's sort of a, an archetypal way of understanding life for me. Mm -hmm. and because I like things to feel weird and wonderful and strange and I mm -hmm. do really want my life to be like a fairy tale probably not a Disney version but like a sort of dark and mysterious fairy tale mm -hmm. it makes me very happy to think about life as the deep dark woods and yeah. try and relate to the uncertainties that come up in my own life like oh well with varying degrees of success of course but yeah. how can I turn this into feeling more like a mystery that is enticing that I'm curious mm -hmm. about rather than an uncertainty of like oh fuck what's what <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm. yeah I love that reframe I think it helps to kind of as we were talking about before tend to the part of you that might feel panicky about uncertainty but once you've tended mm. to that, then kind of going, ooh, maybe I could um, reframe this as a mystery and thinking about mm. all of the possibilities. And it's kind of the two sides of like anything, like you said, anything could happen and anything could happen. <laughs> like if you, if, you, if you don't know what's going to happen, it means that some really amazing things could also happen. Mm. Yes, the whole spectrum is available. And then it just becomes a matter of kind of setting up your choices. And like we were talking about at the beginning, having a plan of like where you want to go or what you mm. want to experience or where you're sort of headed when you're setting out into the deep dark woods. You don't just kind of 
running blindly, even though there is no way of knowing what's going to happen. It's like, at least if I'm trying to get to Baba Yaga's house or I'm trying to get to creating this experience or having that relationship or creating this piece of art or whatever it might be, it's like, at least I've got a direction that I'm headed in. And then yeah. when things come up on the way that are feel a little bit on the uncertain thing or that panicky energy, it's like, mm. oh, that's a sign I need a little bit more support either from myself or from somebody else. Yeah. And then I can tell them, here's where I'm going. Do you know the way? Can mm-hmm. you help me with this step? You, know, you can like, add, You can, can always you stop me? and ask for directions. <laughs> exactly which is often what I do when I'm starting to feel a little bit of that panicky energy Mm. is sort of like, Oh, that's a sign that I need to stop and ask for some directions Mm -hmm. or either look at Google maps or (laughs) consult a map (laughs) of some sort. Consult a map of some sort, whether that's, you know, reaching out to my therapist or a friend Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. just taking a moment with myself to like, Oh, I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. Let's just take the afternoon off, Um, tending to the panic so that it starts to feel mysterious again and then off we go. Yeah. Yeah. You you had a quote from, I think it was an artist. Mm. Yeah, her name's Flora Boley and I love her style of painting. She teaches intuitive painting where you don't really set out to think I'm going to paint a I don't know why a chicken is in my head, but I'm going to paint a chicken. <laughs> I think because of Baba um, Yaga's house. Oh, yeah, that would be it. <laughs> um, yeah, her whole kind of ethos and is described as make bold commitments but be open to change. And so in the context of creating art, it's like I'm going to paint half this canvas bright red, but I'm going to be open to the fact that maybe in 10 minutes I'm going to paint it blue. Mm-hmm. Like it's this kind of... I'm making a bold commitment of we're going to go and explore this waterfall, but I'm going to be open to change that maybe halfway there, we're going to go like, actually, we want to go down to that swimming hole. Or I'm sort of making the commitment of I'm packing up my whole life and I'm moving 2000 kilometers north to see what's going to happen next. And I'm being open to change and things evolving and mm, on the way. So I think that's a really nice way of just phrasing how to navigate the unknown, have a direction, have a desire, have a thing that you are aiming for and then be open to whatever happens on the way. Mm. Yeah. And I love the permission to change your mind Mm. or to make a new decision along the way, change your mind as many times as you want. (laughs) Yes. That feels very liberating. Yeah. I was just thinking, I wish I could remember the first time I changed my mind about needing to go to the laundromat (laughs) on Saturday morning. As you keep talking about the laundromat, though, I'm remembering the time that you found the laundromat birds. Mm. I think it was not long before you made that 2,000 kilometer move. Yes, that's true. And that was a an unplanned delight. <laughs> it wasn't nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. It was like an, oh, I need some clean clothes. And there were these birds. It was awesome. It was sunset. And these little birds, I don't know what they were, were just flying in into the laundromat, doing laps of the ceiling and then flying back out again. Mm-hmm. It was really good. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so... I would like to ask you about how, what you do with clients, how people can work with you, how people can find you. And then I have one more question for you. And I'm going to ask you to read that post that we talked about. Awesome. Yes. My work with clients is all about navigating the unknown. It probably will come as no surprise. The look on your face right now. You're so delighted. (laughs) I am. It's really fun helping people navigate the unknown Um, and helping people find delight in their unknowns and knowing that it doesn't have to be scary and overwhelming. And, you know, there's space for that if it is, but there's also so much room for delight and play and curiosity and all of the good things. Um, I use a combination of coaching of somatic experiencing which is a really beautiful way of helping to increase 
the capacity for our nervous systems to deal with whatever comes in the unknown. Like we were talking about earlier with our window of tolerance and the things that we can experience and still be able to feel good, feel okay. Um, so I do a lot of that and also mixing in art therapy as well, which is very fun. And it's sort of, I like to say optional since a lot of my work is on Zoom, although if you're local to Cairns, come and hang out and we can do it in person. Um, we can either use physical art or just use a lot of mental imagery and kind of the creative process as a little bit more of an abstract thing to inform yeah. the way that we navigate the deep dark woods and mm -hmm. go on adventures and see where we end up. Mm. And Ellen has a Facebook group called The Grand Adventure and she goes live in there and sometimes you can do guided art journeys with her in there every friday it's usually a guided art journey at the moment because that's so friday <laughs> that's friday aussie time which would yeah. be thursday north thursday, america time yeah. and i'm not sure about europe yes it would be probably the middle of the night in europe unfortunately um but the replays are always there so mm. if you want to come and play afterwards i do check back and see if there's any comments or questions or any of that and we have a theme that we explore every week which is quite fun and I do yeah. take requests for themes if you have anything we did do mm. the unknown a while ago maybe it's due for a refresh yeah a new mm. visit um yeah. and especially with your somatic experiencing training can you talk to the level of trauma that you are trained to work with for people who may um, identify as carrying trauma themselves? Hmm, that's a tricky question. Um, it would be the kind of thing that I would say, jump on a call and let's talk about it. Um, let's talk about where you're at, what you've experienced, what you might want holding, and we can feel each other out and see, mm -hmm. does your nervous system feel safe with me? Does my nervous system feel safe with you? Does yeah. it feel like something we'd like to navigate together? Because yeah. it's kind of a tricky... I've case been trained, by case. Yeah, case by case. Because I can work with lots of different kinds of traumas and um, experiences and um, life paths. And it's, yeah, it's the kind of thing that it's a good thing to connect either in person or over Zoom, and then we can mm -hmm. just feel each other out and say, does this feel like it would be supportive and useful and good to mm -hmm. navigate the next step in this adventure together? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm. Um, and I... I 100% would recommend you because we we have a, a relationship where we support each other all the time. So I have personally experienced Ellen's capacity, <laughs> um, which is very deep and loving. And you just, you have this, like every, it's always enough that your transmission mm. around like enoughness and everything is okay. Even if it sucks, it's okay. It's enough. It's okay that it sucks. Yeah. That is that um, truly gold. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it's born out of exactly what we were talking about before, like learning to tend to all of those little things that come up, those little feelings of like, oh, I haven't done enough, or oh, this is a bit not the way I want it to be, or oh, this really sucks. It's kind of instead of trying to change it or fix it or make it go away, it's just be like, wow. And it just brings so much kindness to allow those things to be and to give them space and give them tending mm. and make them welcome. Yeah. Knowing that maybe the situation does suck and maybe you do want it to be different and that's cool. We can work towards having different things come in, making different choices, but it's also okay to be where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's such a gift. Mm -hmm. mm. So if you could choose one thing that you would want our dear listeners to take away from this conversation, what would it be? 
<laughs> the first thing that came to mind was like, open the door. I want to see what's behind that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's that just really encouraging a sense of curiosity about what might be happening next what might be behind that door like what might happen if you really let yourself take a step on the path that you really want to walk or start to create whatever it is in your life that you really want to have happen that maybe feels a little bit scary but maybe just open the door a crack and have a little mm. look and see see what where that little next curve on the path might take you yeah experiment with the unknown yeah yeah. Mm. What would it can I be like? really challenging, but it can also be quite a friendly place sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think I would like people to really hear that asking for support, that receiving support can be a really important part of the process. And that support mm. could be a coach or a therapist like you or me. It could be a friend that you trust. It could be a partner, a family member, mm. um, any, any person who suits what you need in the moment, but that you're not doing it wrong if you need support. If you mm. need support and you get support, that's doing it right. Yes. And also that needing support is also probably a sign that you're doing it right. Because yeah. if you are like I used to be and was adamant that I didn't need support because it's fine, I can do life by myself. <laughs> I wasn't living a very big life and it wasn't very mm. interesting what I was doing. It was mm -hmm. sort of, I was, again, protecting myself from the unknown, being like, yeah. no, I'm fine in this little bubble of smallness. So if you're feeling like, Oh, I need a bit of support. Yeah. Good. <laughs> on the path into something magical. Good. Yeah. Yes. Could you please finish us off by reading the post that you wrote recently? And mm. the this one, what I really love, it really speaks to um, the feeling of like, it's so uncomfortable that things are unresolved and I haven't done enough. I'm not enough. There's not a day to do enough in the day. Um, mm. And when you, when you first read this to me, it was just like a balm for my soul. Mm. Yes. I wrote this a couple of days ago as something that I really needed to hear myself at the end of my day. I was like, I'm just going to write this down in case other people need to hear it too. So it goes, you've done enough with your day. The things you chose to do with the hours and minutes were a good use of your time. And there's nothing more you need to do to make the day worthwhile. And you can put all of the, but I should just, and the never ending to-do list to one side and let the rest of your evening be filled with spaciousness and ease. And tomorrow you can let that be filled with spaciousness and ease too. You've done enough and the things you did were good. Mm. Thank you, magical Ellen. Mm, you're very welcome. <laughs>